All right, we're going to start off looking at the little problem that I had at the end of class last time and discuss what was wrong with it and, um, and then go from there. And then we're going to continue to talk about uh, template columns, how if you don't want the default behavior, you can get the behavior that, that, that you want by converting the column to a template column and then you can put some of your own custom coding in. So we've already seen an example of that where we put a validator in and we saw another example of that where we put a little JavaScript confirm box on a delete. So again, whenever you, whenever you look at the default behavior and say, hey, I don't like that, um, think template column because that's what allows you to, to go in and customize that. All right, the problem we had last time to review went something like this. I had employee table here. And when I ran this, I could go in and do an update, and yet it didn't update, and no error was given. Now, let's try to reason through this. How can it be that there's no update and yet no error? I went into the code and tried to assure myself that, in fact, the update was actually being attempted. I went and I, 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 I put in a bogus table name. And sure enough, when I tried to do the update, I got an error because there was a bogus table name. So I know the update is running. All right. So the question becomes, how is it possible for an update to run to not work? and yet not report an error. Any thoughts on that? Forget about this example specifically. Let's just talk about SQL in general. I have an update statement. Update employee. Set name to Joe where amp ID equals 12. All right. How can that statement run and not update anything but also not give an error. If there wasn't, a there wasn't an employee account. number 12. Right. Exactly. So, if I said update employee set name equals Joe where amp ID equals 12, if there was no employee with a number of, of an employee ID number of 12, I wouldn't get an error and it wouldn't update anything. So, if the where clause on the update fails, it won't necessarily give you an error. It did its job. It updated everyone whose employee ID was 12. Well, there weren't anyone with an employee ID of 12, so it updated no one. So, let's consider the problem. Let's keep that in the back of our mind as we consider this problem. <clears throat> I go in here, and this is where we left off last time, and I edit, and I go in and change the name to Joe, and I click update, and bam, it's back at Mike. All right, it didn't update this row. All right, yet it didn't give me an error. All right, so with that in mind, let's look a little closer at our update statement <clears throat> and at our grid view. If you notice in this example, and I think actually someone did notice this and, and, and say something in class. Um, if you look at the update statement, The update 
statement is missing some of the fields. It's updating the name, the email, the department ID, the social security number, and employee image. But it is not updating the salary. Yet the salary is editable. All right. So what does that mean? Here's probably the best way that, that I can explain what, I, what I'm pretty sure is going on. It's trying to execute the statement and stuff in the values of these parameters, yet there's a mismatch between what is editable and what is updatable. And therefore, somehow that gets thrown off. And it's trying to update the wrong employee. We could probably go and run this through debug and verify that to be true and, and so on. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and if salary, let's say, truly wasn't updatable, I should go into there and make it read only. And if you think about it from a design perspective, that makes sense, right? If, they, if it's not an updatable field, if you don't want them updating that field, then, you know, why have it so that it's updatable? Or, I'm sorry, not updatable, but editable. So if they can go in and edit it, they pretty well should be able to update it too. Otherwise, you are allowing them to change it, but it doesn't do any good because it doesn't save it back to the database. So now I've made salary read only. Let's see if that has an impact on this. Sure enough, it does. Now the editable and updatable columns match up so the update proceeds correctly. Now, that's assuming that I don't want to update salary. If I did want to update salary, what I would need to do is this. <coughs> Excuse me. I would need to go in and make it editable. But I would go and update the update statement to include the salary. I went and refreshed that in one second, and it, it did that. Now I'm going to go back and edit it to add, enable editing. Now let's go and make sure this works. And sure enough, it does. Yeah, you have your hand up. So could you attach those different abilities to update to like certain permissions so if somebody is just like a clerk or something yeah you don't want them to change like salaries and social security numbers yeah somebody has to be authorized a absolutely yeah you could you could do things along those lines if you wanted to is that like in the code behind that or yeah yes you can go and remember it is it's just it's sort of like we did in some of the first examples in class remember that you can you can set properties two different ways, right? You can set properties in design view, you know, when you're when you're building the page and when you're building the form, you go in and you, you assign certain properties. But remember, you can, through your code, you can access and change those properties uh, on the fly based on permissions and so on. Yes? I was working on the um, <clears throat> app. Mm -hmm. with the vehicles and the, or the cars. And mm -hmm. We got from our grid view to the detail page by the VIN. 
You did? That was, that was the first assignment, wasn't it? By clicking on the VIN. Yeah, by clicking on the VIN. That doesn't mean that you passed the VIN. Well, I did in mine. <laughs> anyway, well. <laughs> then. Yeah, okay. Then when I was in, uh, if you could go back to, to Visual Studio, and like when you're in that, mm -hmm. um, updating the, uh, the SQL, mm -hmm. the select statement was on the VIN. And then when I went to update, and, and the, the, it said, what do you want to do with this question mark parameter? Mm -hmm. It was already set for like the select statement. And it was like it couldn't be different for the update statement. Well, let's back up. Because I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. And let's back up. The problem here, the root of this problem is that you should always use a primary key to identify a row in a table. You should not um, allow VIN number to be, um, uh, to, to, you should not pass the VIN number, right? Because the VIN number is not the primary key. Now, I know what you're going to say. The first assignment says click on the VIN number and get to the second page. That's a fact. It does say that. Nowhere in there, though, does it say to click to click on the VIN number and pass on the query string the VIN number. All right, it's two different things. One is physically what they're going to click on, and that could be anything. That could be the model of the car. It could be whatever, all right? And then the second one is what you pass, because remember, when you create a link, you have two things that you can associate with that link. You can associate the um, what the user is going to see and what value gets passed on the link. So you should always use the primary key as the, the mechanism by which you pass from one page for another. Why is that? Well, let's consider some scenarios. And again, for VIN number, yeah, it's true. Every car has a VIN number and so on. But let's say it was such that we order a car and we put it in the system before we know what the VIN number is. You know, let's say we, we found that that is the case. Sometimes the paperwork is, de is delayed, and we don't know what the VIN number for this car is. And so we change the database constraints to allow a blank VIN number. Then all of a sudden, your mechanism goes, goes you know, crashes and burns, because that's no longer a reliable, um, a reliable way of, of passing it. Because you have a unique index on it, and because you've made it a required field, it'll work the way that you've done it. But as a matter of practice, it is, um, it is um, preferred to always use the primary key. Now, how can you do that? Let's see. Here's a department search. Notice that in this grid view, I go in and edit columns. That first field is a link. It's the name of the department. I'm sorry, not the name of the department, the name of the employee. So the link, the text of the link is the name of the employee, yet what I'm passing is the employee ID. So it's possible when you create a link to have the link physically, the text of the link show one thing, and yet behind the scenes pass something else. So in your case, probably the preferred way to do it would be to have that um, pass the uh, car ID as opposed to passing the VIN number. Now, that being said, it shouldn't matter if you do it everything correctly because that WHERE clause is only used for the SELECT statement, that, that fill in the parameter is only used for the SELECT statement. Um, otherwise, the values for the UPDATE statement, for example, get filled in from the, the, the values are in the details view. So it, it shouldn't matter it is the bottom line for that. Did that answer the question or confused about something still or the last thing you said. 
Well, this, let's go to the detail. Your concern was the update used the ID and the select used the uh, VIN number. Right. Well, if we look at this, the wizard detected one or more parameters in your select statement. So this parameter and where it gets filled in only is relevant in the select statement. This is the select statement's parameter. So, so okay. has nothing to do with the update statement. Okay. So for the update, just assume you're going to use. The for the update again, it seems that if there's a match, if you have a good match between the editable fields and the updatable fields, that it it knows what to do, and it fills it in. There is a way to express, explicitly define the parameters, but it doesn't seem like that's necessary, provided that you have a match up between the updatable and editable fields, which it should have anyhow, right? Because otherwise you're pretending to let the person change a field, but you're not storing it. All right? Okay. Okay. All right, let's do more with template fields. All right? Because we have this problem. <coughs> Let's say we want to transfer Mike from the accounting department to the IT department. So I go in here and click edit. Oops. Oh, what is the department number for the IT department? I don't know. Maybe it was five. I'll put that in. Ooh, blew up. All right? Foreign key constraint error. Now we saw last time or the time before, how to get a more user-friendly error. So I'm not going to review that again in the interest of time. But you would put in the on updated event code that checks to see if there was an exception. If there was an exception, display an error message. Otherwise, don't do anything. But what I'm going, to, I'm going to be concerned about now is the fact that department ID really isn't a good field to allow the person to freeform enter in, right? Because I don't remember what those ID numbers were. All right. Chances are the people working on this application aren't going to know what those numbers were. They're going to know, they're going to recognize the department by name, but they have no idea like what the number is, especially when you use surrogate keys when the number really isn't meaningful. All right. What I'd really like to have there is a drop down. It showed me the list of departments and I could pick the department um, that I wanted. So that's what I'm going to do. All right. I'm going to go and I'm going to change this so that I don't get a text box for department. Instead, I get a drop down for department. Now, we know right from the start that that involves creating a template column, right? Because a template column means, hey, I want to do something different than the defaults. So the default behavior for an editable field on a details view or a grid view is to say, hey, when you go into edit mode, put up a text box that allows the person to edit that field. We don't want a text box. We want a drop down. So therefore, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to edit fields, and I'm going to take department ID, and I'm going to, whoops department ID down here. What am I doing? What did I do? I think I deleted it somehow. Department ID. I'm going to convert that to a template field. That allows me to do different than the default behavior. So I click convert to a template field. All right, now it's a template field. Now I can go in and edit template field, and I can pick that I want to edit the edit item field for this column. That is for the department ID. I want the edit item 
template to change. Because when I'm in, and, and again, where it says edit item template, it means this is what you're going to get when you're in edit mode. This is the way the item is going to look when it's being edited. So I'm going to get rid of the text box, and I'm going to put a drop down on the inside here. So I'll go, and I'll put a drop down. I'll then go in and create the data source for that drop down. And configure it. Well, I want to use my connection. What do I want? I want from the department table. I want the department name and ID. And I want to order it by the department name. So I put them in alphabetical order. All right. Now I want to bind that control. I'm going to choose a data source for that and say that, all right, I want to display the department name and the value of that drop down, I want to be the department ID. So far, we haven't done really anything different than any other dropdown that we've done before. We've created a dropdown. We've created a data source for it. We then chose a data source for the dropdown, picked which value we want to see in the dropdown, picked what value we want for the value of that option to be, that is the value behind the scenes. Yes? Can you do that last step again? Which last step? Uh, select the data source. Yeah, select data source. Here, choose data source. I picked the data source I just created, and you have to specify specify what value you want to display in the drop down and what value you want the value of the drop down list to be. In other words, the value behind the scenes that the script is going to see. All right. Now. Here's the, the, the tricky part with this. Here's where this gets different. Because there's actually two sorts of bindings here. One binding is where is what we just did, where we chose a data source for this dropdown. And we said, hey, this dropdown gets its values from the department table. I'm going to display the department name. I'm going to store behind the scenes the department ID. So that's one sort of data binding. The second data binding here, that's it. all that's doing right now is giving me a list of departments. So when I go in edit mode, there's a list of departments, and that's it. Here's where it gets a little tricky, because what I have to do is I have to say how that dropdown links back to my employee table, right? Because whatever value they pick, from this dropdown, I want it to get stored in the department ID that's in the employee table. Right? right now, we have a dropdown that allows me to pick a department ID, but we haven't said where we want to store it in the employee table. That's what we're doing in this upcoming step. And I'll go in here and I'll say, Edit data bindings, and I will say I want this bound to the department ID. So the two things that we have to do when we define a dropdown in a template is one, we need to create a data source and associate that data source with the dropdown to simply say where this is going to get its list of values from. So that's what we did in the first step. I created a data source that said, give me all the departments. I then went in and I, I, I chose that data source for the dropdown, saying, okay, this is where we're getting the list of departments. I then have to say, once we have selected a department, where does it go? And where does it go? It goes to the department ID. Uh, ID that's in the employee table. 
Now, every once in a while, with no rhyme or reason that I've been able to determine, this option up here of field binding is disabled. All right? And I can't simply select the field there. When that happens, you simply select custom binding and put in the words bind, parenthesis, department ID. Let me open up the on-screen magnifier. Say I want, you know, I said I want field binding. I want to bind that to the department ID in the employee table. And I mentioned if for some reason that is disabled, you simply go in and put in the custom binding expression and simply say bind department ID. run this and see this in action. There's one more thing I want to go back and point out. So I go in here, click edit. Notice it shows me now in that department ID field a list of departments. And while you might not have noticed, the department that shows up in that drop down that showed up immediately was this employee's proper department and showed up accounting. All right. So now I can go in and pick another department for this person, information technology, and click update, and I get an error. Ooh. Values given for one or more parameter. I must have clicked off that when I was putzing around with the magnifier. There we go. Now let's go. So I go in and pick Michael. I will edit that. Pick another value. Click update. And notice my department ID changed to whatever info technology was. Yeah, go ahead. If you, on your details view, had pulled in um, department name mm -hmm. instead of a department ID, An or any other thing where you, you're actually... In other words, if you didn't follow my advice to only have the one table in there, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you I know, it's the end of the semester. I'm, 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 sorry, you know, go I ahead. I must have missed that if that was your advice. So yeah, oh, on yeah. a details view, it should only be one. Your, your life will be much easier if from the details view and from the grid view, if you are updating, you only pull in one. Because otherwise, it gets very confusing for it to know like what keys, what fields. You can do it. I mean, it's not as though it's impossible, but 